Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Biblio Fitness. So, if everyone's having a great day thus far or is going to have a great day. Um, so, today is going to be basically the last episode before everything, before the shit hits the fan, I suppose. Um, Dimitri is on the point of doing his little deed. And I'm probably going to have to break that down into a couple episodes because of like the build up, like the couple of days before the tragedy and then the tragedy itself and then the day before. So I'm just really glad that this book has been able to provide so much. And I'm really glad that I uh, started this, you know, this whole thing of kind of giving my reaction and stuff because um, I read it before. But me doing these videos, me doing these reactions, me really being in process because now, like me just making me making these videos is allowing me to reflect and it's kind of forcing me to, you know, um, digest and, and process the, the events and what it can mean and how we can apply it to our lives and things of that nature. So I'm really glad that I started this whole little project thing and that, you know, so much, so much could be talked, so much could be talked about, so much could be discussed with just one book. Even though it's quite a big book, but um, so today is basically um, a very recent development has been transpiring with Grushensko or Alexandra um, Alanzanova, Anjanova. I'm not sure. That's a river, right? Um, so this is literally right after uh, I was talking about the death of um, the elder Josima. There was this um, after that death. He really affected Ali Osher in a way because he became very distraught. Yeah, people were rubbing him all over the dirt. I mean, his elder all over the dirt. This is the man that he revered. This is the man he loved. This is the man he cherished deeply. And now you see how people are disrespecting him and not, you know, loving him the way he was. So this is a moment of pure vulnerability when your ideal and your belief has been absolutely shattered and uh, you know that's when you're at your most vulnerable you have no idea where to go and you're just up in the air and that is the danger of nihilism right the, the danger of you not having a belief you're not having values you're not having a, some sort of structure in which to direct your life in a good or a bad way or being able to make that distinction based on the values that you are now uh, how you now have in place is that you could be turned which way you know anybody could just grab you and have you doing something because you have nothing to hold yourself down and nothing to be grounded on and these are this is that moment of vulnerability for Alyosha and so he meets this guy Rakitin, Rakitin one of the monks but apparently he's not really a monk he's a conniving motherfucker and he pretends to be multiple things at once like a chameleon in order to in order to ingratiate himself with different people and different society, different social groups. And so see, he see he's walking and he sees Alyosha on the ground crying. And he basically starts talking to him. He's like, oh, why are you there? What do you feel about your your elder? Are you mad that he died? Are you mad that he started, you know, exuding corruption? And Alyosha's like, look, dude, I really don't want to, like, deal with any of this right now. And I exactly forgot how it goes, but um, which is why I realized that taking notes is actually extremely important. It's just I didn't know that I was going to talk about this. I really want to get to the, the climax, but this isn't an, an important part in order to understand it all. Um, is, um, the, the conversation comes up for to go into Gucenza's house. Like he's going to go over there and see her. And if you would like to come along and drink some vodka and eat some sausage which you're not supposed to be doing as a monk. But Ali Ocean is vulnerable. He's like, yeah, I don't care. Fuck it, whatever, we'll, we'll do it. And it absolutely astounds this guy. Like, he's like, oh shit, I didn't know you were actually gonna be down for this. And all right, let's go. He grabs him by the arm and they start walking. So you arrive at Gruchensa's house um, in the nicer part of town, I believe, by the by a cathedral. And as they walk in, and they, be, they, they get introduced. Um, Ruchenska's waiting in like a dress, like a small dress, and you could tell that she's very agitated. You could tell like she's there's a lot of pent up anxiety. Because she's like laying on the sofa, tapping, you know, exuding that sort of behavior. That, you know. And as they knock and she asks, oh, who is this? Who is this? She's very startled. She's very alarmed. She believes it's Dimitri. 
knocking on the door waiting for her, which is the last thing that she wants. And as they walk in, she finds out it's that taking, I think his name is a Rakete or some shit. These Russian names, bro. Uh, and I don't mean to, mean to pronounce, mispronounce them as some sort of attack. Um, it's just my English and my ignorance not being able to pronounce them correctly. So my apologies. So as she walks in there, they walk in there, and she's absolutely, you know, surprised that Alyosha has now arrived. Like, you know, she never would have thought that this guy would be pulling up at his house so willingly, so willingly with this guy. And you, like I said, she looks like she's going to, go out somewhere like she's waiting for someone to pick her up like she's looking nice and she has a good veil and shit like that and i can ask her like what's going on and this is the first time we hear a little bit of the backstory of good old grushenska you know this was a girl that had 17 years like she's waiting for x we never heard about this before no no um apparently at 17 years old she was dumped by a polish officer uh that she was engaged but she got dumped she was left on the streets, poor, skinny, raggedy, and um, and it was the man, it was the merchant Samsonov, the old guy, that is the one that took her in, and, and you know apparently they had an agreement that she couldn't sleep or fuck around with anybody else. Um, which is bizarre, but you know, but that's just how it was back then, you know. Um, older men with younger women, that's just how it was for a very long time. The, the, the vast majority of human history is that way. Um, I always make the, you know, make the example of people is like look at quinceañeras, for example. So Spanish love celebrating quinceañeras, it's ingratiated in our tradition, but the whole preface of the quinceañera was when you you as a woman drew blood for the first time, you know, had your first period, um, your dad would literally have you dressed up like a like like cattle and looking good, looking cute, invite the whole town, and auction you up. You know who's the high to the highest bidder to the most to the best match in terms of some sort of you know marriage alliance because throughout the course of human history marriage was nothing more than alliances you know daughters were used for marriage and daughters were used to forge alliances with different kingdoms and different towns different lords stuff like that um dynast dynasties and shit like that until quite recently you know good obviously nobody wants to be used as a fucking prop um, so I'm glad we got away from that for the most part, even though I'm sure that transpires all the time. Which it still does. But, that's beside the point. So, yeah, so they entered this sort of agreement. And this guy has now come back. Uh, apparently she received a messenger from this man um, about a month or two ago. Saying that he wants to come back. And being all condoled, you know, all very lovey-dovey and grandiose and grandioloquent in his messaging about him, Mr. and stuff like that. And Ratican makes the case that he's probably a broke bitch. He's a broke boy. He heard that this girl had money and now he's here to smooch her off. Um, so there's this torment lying in between Grushenska and now this is all starting to make sense, right? Now, um, because this whole dichotomy, this whole, um, this whole feud between father and son and is predicated on trying to get this girl and she was very indecisive like you know Dimitri's like well why is she picking me and she picking him like what is she struggling with what is she possibly going through and it's this like it's not choosing between him or the father it's choosing this man that this man is coming back and so as Alyosha steps in, he's still very vulnerable. This girl is very happy. He's like, oh, I wish you would have come a couple of days sooner, but that's okay. You're here. And then she sits on her lap. I mean, she sits on his lap. And she's like, oh, I, I'm, I'm here. I, I could celebrate everything that's going so well. This man is coming back to my life. And, and um, I'm just going to run off with him. And she didn't want Dimitri to pull up because she wants to be gone by the time he comes back. And we'll... We'll get to that in the next episode because that's going to be really juicy. I'm probably going to have to break it down to two parts because there's just so much to discuss. And I don't want to make an hour video. Um, and so she brings out the champagne. And Gratik and uh, Radikin, uh, uh, whatever. The other guy starts asking Alyosha, would you like to take a sip as well? Since you were the one that uh, proposed that you were willing to drink, to partake in drinking alcohol. And he says, yeah, but as he takes a sip, I feel like, you know, when he's, she's sitting on him, 
he's going through this transformation. Like he's he's very like in his grief he found armor, right? Because this other guy brought him because you know he thought he was gonna fall into temptation. He thought Gruchansk was gonna eat him up and seduce him and have him break his ways and shit like that. But in Alyosha's grief, he wasn't even paying attention. He didn't care. He didn't, you know, he, she was sitting on his lap and it's not like, he was like, oh, I want to, like, no, you know. And that grief became his steel, his armor. Um, and so um, I believe they start going on, that she starts talking about that. And, and then she starts giving a background on her life. And she's talking about how when he left, when the Polish officer left her for dead, she was very angry. She was very bitter. Um, she would cry herself for sleep at night and bang on the floor. And, and that's how she became very, you know, ambitious and very angry and very, and, and very, and very distant from people, you know? Like she was like, she felt like a bitch. She felt like someone bitched her out. She felt like someone treated her like shit tossing her aside and she was going to unleash this frustration onto the world and and that's how she acted for the majority of her life and, you know she's leading on a father and son basically almost wanting them to kill each other and she doesn't care she doesn't fucking care about the consequences she only cares about herself and she promised herself that she'll never be that way she's like well look at me all plump now i have some money i know how to do shit and but then that anger is starting to surface again because she's like like this guy's calling me back and i'm gonna answer her like a good little dog like a good little bitch you know the guy disappeared he dumped me and now i'm just gonna fly off like it's all good and this is what i'm really gonna do and i'm gonna be happy with this this torment going on and now Leosha is seemingly the first person to take pity on her first person to really say you know as she's going through this she starts crying and, and going and, and really having these emotions really come to the surface and, and being displayed in front of these two gentlemen. And and he starts basically telling this uh, uh, record, rack, the other guy, basically, I, 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 mean, I, I can't get the name. Um, he starts telling this other guy, like, hey, look, like, you know, like she's clearly going through stuff and she's clearly bigger than us. Like, look at what she's going through. She. She's really dealing with these emotions and she probably has more heart and more compassion than we do. She's probably a better person than we are, him and his naivety, right? And, you know, taking pity on her, like knowing that he, she's going through it. That she's going through this painful, uh, painful realization that the choice is going to have to be made. And how are you going to take these choices and are you going to be able to live with this choice of going back to this guy that dumped you? And now, out of the blue, is coming back, and you're just gonna fall on him, like good little girl. Uh, and out of nowhere, she goes like, "And like, I don't want you to call me a good person." And she goes on with a story about this woman with an onion, uh, the onion story, which is basically this old lady that was basically a terrible person, did not help anybody, did not do anything altruistic in any way, shape. A very selfish individualist, um, which is not something that Dostoevsky is a big fan of. As you, if you are reading the book, you can already tell. <laughs> not a big fan of individualism. Um, that's not the message of the book at all. Um, except for one deed that old woman does, which is give an onion to a little boy. But then she dies. She gets cast to hell. And a guardian angel trying to find a way to justify to go to heaven because God is like, dude, what proof do you have? What does she, what has she done anything? Like, has she done any good to anybody? Because I don't, I don't see it. And they go, but she gave one onion to a good boy, like a little boy, she gave an onion. And he's like, all right, I need you to go, you know, give her an onion. And if you, she, if you could drag her out of the lake with that onion without it breaking, she'll be good. So the guardian angel goes down, grabs the onion, and hands it to her, and she starts grabbing on. But as she's grabbing on, she's being lifted up, other people start latching on, trying to get out of the lake. But her and her spitefulness and her selfishness, she starts moving around, kicking people and saying, no, 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 this is my onion. I'm the only one that's going to make it out. 
you fail. The fucking onion breaks apart, you're done. Um, and even in your selfishness, even in like you're being rescued and you don't want to help anybody else. You could have helped so many other people with that one onion, but yet you clearly did not learn your lesson, even in the afterlife. So she stayed in the lake forever. And this is the story that's relayed to Gruchesca, uh, that Gruchesca relays to Alyosha. She tells him, like, I'm not a good person. I like fucking people. I like being this person that plays people and then takes some money and does all this shit. Um, she's only given one onion. You know, she doesn't want to be called a good person because that's not who she is. And Alyosha's hearing all this, but he's still being very thoughtful. You know, he's really the first person to ask her these sort of questions and not look at her as a villain. And so this transformation is really starting to take place in Alyosha now that now that the father is dead, now the elder Joseph was dead, he's starting to rise himself above, you know, the ideal, the whole thing, you know, and that's, um, that's a really akin to Greek philosophy is, not to sit in the judgment of others, you know, not like that's just, you know, Jesus didn't say anything OG about it, um, about that sort of thing, you know, turning the other cheek, not to sit in the judgment of others, not to scold people not to put yourself on some sort of pedestal because at the end of the day we've all been ignorant we've all been we've all done stupid things we've all done heinous acts you know we've all participated in those sort of stuff so we shouldn't judge other people because we've been in that situation so who are we to judge we should show compassion and that's what he does he shows compassion um it's just very interesting because while this is going on racket again radican whatever the fuck his name is um starts throwing drafts Start saying, oh, look at, look at you, like, you guys are talking about onions, are you fucking going crazy or something? Like, what are you talking about? Like, why, why are you even focusing on this shit? Like, you can tell, like, he's just using you, and, and she goes crazy on her. She's like, oh, why the fuck are you talking about like this? Like, you're not my friend, you're just a lackey. And she grabs some money and throws him, like, oh, yeah, I made a bet with him, by the way, that if he brought me over, he brought me to you, he's gonna get this X amount of money. And this guy's extremely embarrassed. He's like, oh, fuck, like, you don't know I'm fucking giving them money for this guy. Like, I look like a sellout, which you are, but that's beside the point. And, and the whole reason they even brought the champagne out was because of a bet as well. Like, if this guy ever pulls up, we're going to grab champagne and we're going to drink. And this is what, what transpired. And he's just, he's, he's, you can tell that this guy is just extremely venomous because he really want, he, like, the events that are transpiring, like, Alyosha and Gruchevka actually bonding and actually talking about it like this and actually being understanding without Alyosha getting fucked or fucking for the first time and breaking his vows as a monk and shit like that. This is not the way that this guy wanted these, this, this whole thing to go. It's not the conclusion he wanted, so he's becoming extremely bitter, extremely mad because it's just not going according to plan. He's going the opposite, actually. And in the middle of that conversation, um, the one of the maids goes and and tells her, "Hey, look, there's a messenger, and it's the guy." And she's like, "Oh, you guys have to fucking go. You guys have to leave. This guy's coming." Uh, and like. And she's like, you know what? I'm gonna be a good little dog. I'm a good, good little bitch, and I'm gonna go with him. This is gonna make me happy. Tell your brother that I only loved him for an hour, but uh, not, but but you know, I at least I cared for him for that one time. And please don't forget about me. And she did that. And this whole thing is really interesting because, like I said, um, a murder is about to take place, and the the this all this animosity, all these negative emotions, all this shit. It's gonna have to come to a head one way or the other. You know, two men fighting like this, two men feuding like this, there's only one logical conclusion, and that's violence. Um, it's very, very, very rare that we men can build ourselves up to the boiling point and amicably resolve this. You know, all the jabs and all the taunts and all the threats and the fact that, you know, Dimitri did break into his father's house and beat the shit out of him to the point of death. Um, it's gonna be near impossible to resolve this in any other fashion, right? Except through violence. And she doesn't care. Luchetta doesn't care. She's very selfish. She's a bitch. You know, instead of being honest and telling these two, like, hey, neither of you are getting this pussy. Um, I'm going with this other guy. Yeah, doesn't care. And at the same time, you know, I do understand, like, she's probably scared that if she tells Dimitri, he would probably kill her. 
but you know that's the right thing right like this guy is literally about like ready to kill his own father which is for you that's not that, that that's not right you know <laughs> um which even in the beginning doesn't make any sense what sort of father and son would want to kill each other for a fucking woman when there are just so many other women in the world but you know these sort of events happen all the time, right? You know, friends lose, you know, friends separate because of a girl and uh, family members and cousins and stuff like that, brothers for a girl. Um, you know, that's what happens when you don't have the ideal, right? And I think that's the message with Dostoevsky is that when you don't have these values, I'm sorry, when you don't have this ideal looking over you, in your actions. There's no fear of consequences because there's nobody looking over you. There's no punishment for these actions. But you're just gonna be left to your own devices, your own sensuality, and damn the consequences. And this is all leading to a head because Dimitri's starting to get really desperate here. Um, he's broke, he has no money, and he's an idiot, so he has no idea how to make money. And we're gonna discuss that later on for sure in the upcoming episode. Um, but Gutierrez is about to fly. She's about to disappear. She's about to leave everyone behind. And God only knows how this guy, Dimitri, is going to take that. Because she's going to disappear. And him and his jealousy, who knows how he's going to process this information, right? So, and this is very interesting development as well. Because, like I said, Alyosha metamorphoses into what his elder Josimon was. And because after this whole event, um, he goes back to the monastery and he has... And he visits the father and the guy, you know, he's in his coffin and stuff like that. And Father Pisces is reading um, the, the, the gospel while, you know, next to him. And while this happens, Alyosha has the breaking, the, 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 the evolution, right? He has a dream because while he is dozing in and out and praying, the father of Pisces having, you know, is talking about the story of Jesus and at the wedding, right? Turning water into wine and inviting all these people and all by all the grace. You know what? The first miracle, right? I believe that's the first miracle, right? And um, it, it's in a region where it's known to be extremely poor and stuff like that, where people are not going to be able to afford all that wine for a banquet. And while he's having these dreams, he hears his, he hears the elder Josima. And he hears them um, talking to him and saying like, hey, look, you know, after even all this time, Jesus is offering the wine to everybody, inviting them to the banquet, inviting them to his love and his company. And don't you want to see him? Don't you want to be with him? And although she's like, dude, I don't think I could face that guy right now. But the message is like, you know, everybody deserves the love. Everybody deserves to be part of this. And, you know, no matter where you come from, no matter where you're from, no matter who you are, you deserve love, you deserve compassion, you deserve respect. And when Alyosha wakes up, he literally goes outside and he starts getting on the ground and starts kissing him and tears start flowing down his, his eyes. He's really going through these, this holy epiphany because this is something that, you know, the other Joseph must said, like after his, you know, failed duel with the guy, and he goes through the metamorphosis of trying to go to a monastery. He tells, he always talks about like, you know, love everything around you. Even the tears that you have for this herb, you should love and love the trees and love the earth and love the air and love the thing, like I love everything. And now Alyosha is now able to really transform into that sort of individual, a man that really is going to rise above it all. A man that is not going to be tempted by the world, tempted by all the foolishness, being able to be now is going to be steadfast in his belief, steadfast in his mission of love and to love all and to forgive all and for and to forgive for all and all. Um, so he he went he went through his own temptations, right? Like like Jesus, right? Like you're with a woman and you're you're drinking and she's clearly you know trying to fuck with you in the beginning, of course. And he went through it and he passed through it without you know without losing. You know, took a sip of champagne. He's like, ah, I think I'm good now. You know, he came back to his senses, and he came back to his beliefs. And now these beliefs are going to be ingratiating him forever and for like you know and for good this time. 
So we'll see how that plays out in the events that are going to transpire on the next episode. So hope you all have a great day. Hope you all enjoyed. Um, I'm going to keep saying this every time. Hope you all get to read this wonderful book. Um, I'm probably going to end up reading... I kind of want to take... I, I kind of want to get to Epictetus after this, you know, kind of like switch it up a little bit, but I'm still tempted to read Crime and Punishment as well, because I can only imagine how good Crime and Punishment must be, since that is his masterpiece, but I'm still debating. I'm only like halfway through the book, so I still have some time to think it up. Um, aside from that, I hope you all make some amazing games today. Hope you all get to read. Hope you all have a great day. Remember, you are worth it. You are great. Um... You have no idea how important you are to the people around you. So don't ever think that you are just some sort of leech or something like that. Um, you know, hope you today, you get to love yourself a little bit more and you become a little bit more grateful for the things around you. You know, um, having a change in attitude and a perspective really is life saving, right? Instead of focusing so much on the negative, focus on what you have done and focus on who you are in relation to who you used to be. Um, so I love y'all and I hope y'all have an amazing day. Peace.